Okay, um, just uh, first of all, should say for those who haven't been to Jodrell Bank before, this is the typical weather of Jodrell Bank. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, <laughs> always like, it's always a lovely day. Um, and uh, what I was, what I was going to do is tell you a little bit, uh, first of all, about, about uh, the, the story of Jodrell Bank, just to start with. Um, and that's really because it's just recently been our 70th anniversary. Um, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of the history of Jodrell Bank here. Uh, and perhaps a little bit of the future as well. Um, so, um, so Jodrell Bank's story begins with um, Bernard Lovell uh, returning to the University of Manchester in, in, in July of 1945, at the end of the war. He'd been working on radar during the war. He'd been dragged, dragged out of the physics department in, in 1939, went off to work on radar, uh, and then, um, and then he, um, he came, back to the, uh, came back to the university to try and carry on his research. That's the university department. Uh, as, as it still exists in Manchester, that's a recent photograph, as you can tell. Um, uh, that's about 1945, actually. Um, and he was working on um, uh, cosmic rays, so particles coming from outer space, charged particles between the atmosphere coming from outer space. Uh, and what he was interested in was whether he could actually get radio echoes from them, so to use his radar to bounce a signal off the trail that the cosmic ray leaves in the atmosphere. Uh, this is a paper, or the beginning of a paper, um, that he wrote with, um, with Patrick Blackett, who was the head of Department of Physics. He wrote that during the war, um, talking about whether they could get that sort of, uh, uh, that sort of signal back from a cosmic ray echo. So that was just to distract them while they were being bombed on the airfields that he was working on at the time. So when he came back to Manchester, he actually brought this radar kit into the, into the university there at Manchester and set it up and started trying to get um, uh, radar echoes off cosmic rays. <coughs> But unfortunately, it was ruined by uh, radio interference from trams. So we just mentioned radio interference from things like mobile phones. Uh, the problem in the city of Manchester at the time was that there were trams. And here's a lovely photograph I found of Manchester's last tram, it claims. Um, which is obviously not true, because we have trams again. For anybody who knows Manchester, we have a very nice tram network these days. That was 1949. The, the electrical motors on the trams produced radio interference. He wanted to get away from that radio interference. And... Um, you're going to have to walk right across the front, I'm afraid, um, and try and find a seat somewhere. There are a few. People can wave when people come in. They can direct them to the seats. That might be helpful. Uh, okay. Um, so he wanted to, um, to to get away from the radio interference. He wanted a place away from the city. And the university owned some ground out here uh, that the botany department was using. So they, so they set off from Manchester, uh, took their army trucks. In fact, there was various people who were still in the army with nothing to do in late 1945, and so they were, they were more than happy to come and help uh, bring the army trucks, set up the equipment here at Jodrell, and there they are, uh, dragging the, the equipment into the fields, down at the south end of the site here, with the help of the local farmers. And this picture was taken on the first day at Jodrell Bank in December of 1945, showing um, the botany huts on the left-hand side that the botanists were using, and the radar transmitter uh, and receiver unit there with uh, being set up. Uh, outside, alongside those botany huts. Um, and actually, it's only, I only recently noticed, this picture's a very famous photograph in the history of Jodrell Bank, and I only recently noticed that there's actually somebody sitting up there. Uh, I think that's actually somebody sitting on the thing, setting up the, setting up the, the equipment at the, top of that, at the top of that area. Um, there was really only um, uh, Lovell uh, and the local farmers here at the time, and the, and the botanists. Um, he was on his own when he, first, when he first came once the people had left him. And he set up the equipment and started sending these radar pulses up into space. And they did get echoes, uh, but it turned out they were from the Geminids from the meteor shower in, in, in December of 1945. So, so the meteors come in. They also leave an ionized trail in the atmosphere, just like the cosmic rays would do. Um, and they were actually getting re reflections off those meteors. So it wasn't cosmic rays, it was meteors that became the first um, area of study. This is a map of Jodrell. You can either see on the big screens or on the small screens at the side. So sort it of shows you the, the layout of the, the sort of rather complicated layout of the observatory site indicated by the, by the red line. Uh, we are in a building that isn't built on this satellite photograph because um, it's relatively new um, there. The Lovell Telescope is just below it, you can see sort of from overhead here. Um, but the botany grounds are right down at the bottom end of the site. So that was the original bit of um, Jodrell Bank. That was all that existed in 1945. The university had bought that land just before the war. So that's where Lovell set up. 
Um, but actually, they quite quickly moved from the botany grounds, because the botanists didn't really want them hanging around down there with all their equipment. They quickly moved to this field here. So the university bought this field, uh, and they started to set up their equipment there. So here's sort of early 1946, with the farmers again, very, very helpfully, uh, using their tractors to pull these um, army trucks um, into the field uh, just to the north of the botany grounds, uh, just, just south of where we are now. And here's one of those army trucks, it's called a Park Royal, which is the company that made these, these particular types of truck, and you can see the camouflage paint on that, on that truck there, and you can see there's a guy called Banwell, who was standing up on the top of the truck, setting up the, uh, setting up the aerial there. It's obviously a nice warm day, he's got his top off, I think, actually, on that picture as well. So that's uh, uh, what Jodro was like at the time, was all these people setting up all, all this sort of equipment across this field, you can see that in this picture, lots of different trucks with aerials sort of sprouted up all over the place, scattered out across this field, and it became known by, by local people as the fur ground, because they weren't really sure what was going on, but these guys were building all this weird sort of equipment for picking up radio waves coming from, coming from space. Um, this is quite a nice little um, movie, uh, which um, is, we found recently in our archive. Uh, which is a film of something called the Searchlight Aerial. It sort of indicates that uh, what, the sort of what happened after the war was there was a lot of, a lot of equipment going um, begging, really, that was sort of available, electronic equipment. Um, in this case, a Searchlight that had been used um, in London um, to, to help defend London. Uh, and they went and brought these, used to bring this equipment on trucks back to Jodrell Bank and reuse it. So this is a, you'll see the such light come into view in the middle, but what they've done is they've used it because it was a handy thing that turned around and tipped up and down um, like that. So that was all they needed it for. They didn't need the actual such light facility. It was just the fact that it had, a, had, had uh, bearings on it that meant it could turn around and tip. And so then they strapped all the scaffolding tubes to it and, and put wires and aerials on this thing to basically use it as a radar instrument to study meteors. Uh, and in fact, the remnants of that searchlight aerial are still here at Jodrell Bank, in, 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 down at the south end of the site, the sort of base of it's still here. So here's um, uh, two of the astronomers here at Jodrell in the late 1940s, looking at these, these sort of meteor traces that they were getting from this, these radar studies. So originally come here to study cosmic rays, um, he um, was studying meteors, because that's where he got the echoes back from. So this was this paper, remember, that he'd written in, in the war, uh, to say that they were going to get these echoes off cosmic rays. Unfortunately, he made a mistake in this paper, um, and uh, this is this is a summary from his autobiography. It says, the day he posted the draft of that paper to Blackett, we were being machine gunned by German aircraft on our cliff site in Dorset, and it was no time to consider effects of damping factors high in the atmosphere. <laughs> he basically forgot a term in the, in the equation. Um, which meant that the signal he was going to get back from the cosmic ray echo was at least a thousand times weaker than he was expecting. So, um, so they were never going to detect cosmic ray echoes with the equipment they had. And I suppose it's interesting to say that if he hadn't made that mistake, if the, if the German aircraft had not been machine gunning them, um, then he'd have never bothered coming to Jodrell Bank and Jodrell Bank wouldn't exist. Um, so that was interesting. So what they needed was a bigger, much bigger aerial. Um, this is a nice photograph of the of, the, uh, of what they constructed then, so 1947 they started building this, it's called the Transit Telescope. Um, so it was a big mesh bowl, uh, pointed straight upwards, uh, collects radio waves coming in from overhead. You can just about see the mesh, the mesh bowl sort of hanging between these um, scaffolding poles here. And they reflect the radio waves up to the top of, to a focus which is at the top of the tower in the middle. So this was 218 feet across, it was the biggest telescope in the world at the time, uh, and it was what Lovell needed to get enough signal to detect the cosmic ray echoes. Well, they didn't detect cosmic ray echoes. And in fact, the story then really led, it was really driven by the guy on the left here, who's called Robert Hanbury Brown, and the right is Cyril Hazard. Um, so Hanbury Brown was, uh, again, come from radar in the war. He came to Jodrell Bank in 1948 realised they'd built this massive thing and this might be useful for not picking up echoes from cosmic rays, but for picking up radio waves coming from much farther away in space. Um, and they actually uh, made two quite interesting discoveries. One was that they found the remnant of a supernova, 
uh, from 1572, Tico, Tico Brahe's Supernova of 1572. Um, it faded away after a few months. It was a, it was a bright star, basically, up near Cassiopeia. Um, it faded away after a few months. Nobody had seen it again since the 1500s. Um, and we picked up the fading glow of that supernova in the radio part of the spectrum with this, with this new telescope, with this transit telescope. They also uh, picked up radio waves coming from the Andromeda galaxy. So the Andromeda galaxy goes more or less overhead, uh, these latitudes. Um, and so, you know, they were able to use this, this, this dish to pick up radio waves coming from that, that galaxy. Which was the first time anybody had knowingly picked up radio waves coming from another galaxy. Um, so it's quite a, 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 you know, an important discovery. Um, so basically, as you can sort of imagine, we're talking about radio waves here. Part of the, part of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, so out beyond, out way beyond the infrared and the microwaves, you've got the, you've got the radio waves. And of course, these days, uh, we would use all these sort of bits of the spectrum to do astronomy, um, but at that time, really, radio waves were the first major part of the spectrum to be, to be, uh, start to be fully investigated. Um, and so radio astronomy was invented um, <laughs> by these people here and, uh, and at Cambridge and in Sydney. So there was th three major radio astronomy groups in the world in the late 1940s, all of whom had come out of the work on radar in the Second World War. And here's Lovell and the group, Lovell in the middle there, um, standing in front of that searchlight aerial. So, you know, we all have, we have staff photographs here. In fact, we should take a photograph of everybody here in front of this telescope later, if we can remember to do that. We now stand in front of the big Lovell telescope here, but before they had that, they stood in front of the searchlight aerial. Um, and this was in 1951, and he was made the world's first professor of radio astronomy. That word, did, the phrase radio astronomy didn't exist until just a few years before that. So this thing was great, this big, big ball, this big mesh was great, but it could only look more or less straight up. It had a, had a pole that did this, you could tip that pole around and so it could steer a little bit on the sky, but it was pretty much straight up. If any of you have seen the FAST radio telescope in China, which is just about to be inaugurated in the next week or two, a big 500 metre wide, wide thing, that does the same thing, except they've got a rather cleverer system than tilting a pole um, to let it steer about a little bit to see, to see a lot larger patch of sky. So they needed something that steered. This is the front cover of the, what, uh, the, the book, the blue book, that um, uh, was the design study for the big telescope out here, the Mark I telescope, as it was originally called. And this is the artist's impression from that design study from, from uh, 1951, I think it was published. Um, we are uh, we're in a building which is best, if, it was, if this photograph was taken now, you'd be able to see the building we're in here. Um, so there's a control building which is still here, uh, the little telescope which is a, a mesh telescope as it was originally, originally conceived. So they built it over five years from 1952 to 1957. Um, it, it took over when it was completed in 1957 from that 218 foot telescope as the world's largest telescope because it's 250 feet in diameter. It's still the third largest steerable telescope in the world. Um, even now, almost 60 years later, it's the 60th anniversary next next year. Um, and you can see actually that it had a, had a solid surface when they, as it was eventually built, because they realised they couldn't they couldn't make a mesh surface of the of the fineness that they, they needed to do the work they wanted to do. It was massively in debt um, by the time they got to the end. The original estimate was about of order 150,000 pounds in the early 1950s and in the end it cost about £750,000 in, in money of that time. Um, so that's, you know, we're used to things running over budget these days, but uh, that, at that time that was, that was a significant amount of money. Uh, and so it was real trouble. The, the telescope looked like it might not be completed. Uh, Lovell was, in, was under investigation by the Public Accounts Committee and may well have been sent to jail for spending more money than they had available because a lot of it was, the vast majority was government funded. Um, and this is, I think this should work, this is a recording of Lovell talking about this um, uh, a few years ago. I said to Henry Brown, we need a miracle to save us. Well, that kind of miracle came on October the 4th, a few weeks later, 1957, uh, when the Sputnik 1 was launched. So, so that was the thing that saved the, that, that telescope was the fact that uh, right in October of 1957 the Russians launched Sputnik 1. Um, 
the, we weren't interested in tracking the Sputnik itself, the satellite, what, what people were interested in was actually tracking the rocket, and the reason was the rocket was an intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, and so actually we, the lover was asked by the government to track that missile with a radar, um, and this is him pointing out the echo from the rocket that they received over, over the weekend of the 11th and 12th of October in 1957. It's actually the, almost the same rocket that carried Tim Peek into space. If you're interested in rockets, you can look back to the forerunner. The, 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 you know, it's been developed a little bit, but not that much actually from those first uh, Russian rockets still working very well. Um, so that opened up a whole new area of work for Jodrell, which was space tracking. Um, wasn't intended. Uh, to do space tracking, but here's Lovell and John Davis, I think it is, standing behind him there, uh, in the control room here at Jodrell, um, tracking both the Russian and the American space rockets. Um, this, was the, this is a recording of the first uh, rocket ever to reach another celestial body to hit the moon in September of 1959, uh, tracked here at Jodrell Bank, sent, launched by the Russians, Luna 2, um, and it reached the moon. You can sort of hear the signals now that were picked up here at Jodrell Bank. Basically, when those signals stopped, um, they knew the telescope, had, uh, the, the satellite had reached, the uh, spacecraft had reached the moon. Um, we also picked up signals from Luna 9, uh, which was a, another Russian spacecraft, that the first proper moon landing, if you like, without, mind you, without people. Um, so it was, a, it was a soft landing on the moon, uh, took a photograph of the moon's surface. Um, that was uh, sent back to Earth in the form of a radio signal. It was hacked into by the people here. Um, in fact, it was John Davis that sort of recognised the signal was of the form of an early type of fax machine. Uh, and he, they said, oh, it sounds like the sort of thing you get from a fax machine. And so they put out a call and the Daily Express in London actually sent up the fax machine um, and it was plugged into the back of the telescope and out came this picture of the which, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, sound, sound was amazing and was amazing um, and did, didn't particularly, the Russians weren't particularly impressed by that, uh, uh, by that at the time they, because they did they, prefer to release their own photographs first, but, but, the, but there you go. Um, so, um, what about radio astronomy? That's all space tracking. It wasn't really what that telescope was designed to do. That's that design study. Um, this is what it was expected to do, these sorts of uh, astro astronomical work. So radio stars and nebulae, solar physics, planetary radar, cosmic rays, aurora and stuff. Actually, a few of those things we still do, but the vast majority of those we don't do at all. And so we actually use the telescope now to look at things that we never even knew existed. Um, at that time. Um, through that period of the 1950s to 1960s, the, one of the big pieces of work that was done here was to develop long baseline interferometry. So connecting telescopes together across large distances uh, were basically rather than, um, w w when you have a single telescope, um, you, um, you, have, um, you have a problem that you get a fairly blurred view in the radio part of the spectrum. Uh, if, you, if you make the telescope bigger, you get a sharper view. Uh, but you can only make it about as big as this one out here. That's still no sharper than the human eye in terms of the sharpness it can see. We wanted we want to be able to see things much more sharp, much, much uh, more sharp than that. So what we do is we connect together two or more antennas. Uh, we link them together and they act like different bits of a giant telescope, much larger telescope. You could do that with cables. You could run cables between the two, uh, but that can only get you so far. You can't run cables for many tens, hundreds of kilometres. And so they knew that um, uh, they needed to do it a different way, so they basically used radio links. And that was one of the major projects at Jodrell through the 50s and 60s, was developing those long baseline links. Um, we also observe a, a, a lot of pulsars at Jodrell Bank, even to the present day. Um, the first pulsar was discovered by Jocelyn Bell at Cambridge in 1967. Um, but just the, 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 the sort of Tuesday before the... Um, before the, that was announced in, uh, in the Nature Journal that arrived here on the doormat on the Saturday morning, um, Lovell was in a meeting in London and he, was, he sat next to Fred Hoyle who was at Cambridge and, and, and Fred and he was saying, oh, anything interesting going on? And Fred Hoyle said, oh yeah, we found these really interesting uh, flashing radio sources with very regular flashes. And Lovell said, oh, it'll be, it'll be out in Nature this weekend, he said. 
kept it quiet for a while. Uh, and so Lovell came back and told people here. And uh, Graham Smith, uh, Sir Francis Graham Smith, uh, now Gra Graham was sort of um, uh, in very interested in this. And so he rang up uh, colleagues in Cambridge, which is where he worked before, and they told him the coordinates of this new discovery. And so this telescope started observing pulsars on, I think, the Thursday afternoon of that week, uh, be just before it was published. And within several weeks, we'd actually got more data on these pulsars than the Cambridge group had gathered in the previous uh, six months or so, basically because they were using a telescope that didn't steer. And so they had to wait till this thing came past, and then they could gather data, and then wait again and gather data. But the, big, the power of this thing is you can point it anywhere you like. So it became a, became a really important um, instrument for observing pulsars. Uh, this is a recording of a pulsar made just, we just made recently. Uh, with the telescope here. So you sort of see the typical properties of a pulsar is this regular flash, which for fun you can turn into a sound. It's not actually a sound, it's a flash in the radio part of the spectrum. Um, so we know these things, that now we, we very quickly realised actually that, that they, they weren't Little Green Men. Um, so they weren't, the first one was called LGM-1, Little Green Man 1. Um, <laughs> because, it, because it was such a regular thing, it was maybe like a semaphore or something, somebody flashing to us across the universe. Um, but uh, it was actually a, a rotating neutron star, so a dead, a dead star, a collapsed object, uh, the centre of a star that explodes as a supernova collapses down to be something about 20 kilometres across, um, but, but weighing maybe <coughs> one and a half times as much as the sun. Uh, and as they spin, you get a sort of lighthouse beam of radiation from the magnetic poles. And so you get, you get that regular flash, flash, flash as this thing spins around. Um, here's Jodrell Bank in the uh, late 1960s. Uh, so a view from the building we're in now is in the bottom left corner of this uh, of this picture, so this is sort of looking south. So you see the Lovell Telescope, or at that time it was called the Mark I Telescope in the foreground. Uh, you see that the botany huts are actually the two huts at the back. So the botany department is still there at the back of the greenhouses down in the south. And you can also see the control building, a small telescope on the side of the control building. That 50-foot telescope was used just after this photograph was taken to track the Eagle lander onto the surface of the moon in 1969. And, and this is a new telescope, the Mark II, uh, built in 1964, which we still have here, uh, here today. And those two telescopes working together, uh, we, uh, first the Lovell and then the other as well, were used to identify an interesting radio source, which is indicated by the arrow here. So a sort of bright little spot of radio emission in the sky, which when, when it was followed through, through the 1970s, in 1979, it was finally realised what this was. This is a spectrum or two, two, a spectrum of two, there's two sources, two bright objects, up, the visible objects at this position in the sky, uh, one above the other, and this is an optical, a visible light spectrum of each of those two uh, sources that basically look uh, uh, identical. And so it was realised that actually these two things on the sky, first, first associated with the radio source indicated at the top there, uh, were actually two images of the same thing. Um, so not two different objects, but actually two separate images of exactly the same object. And that's a gravitational lens. Um, so this is a, a recent radio map of this, um, which, um, which shows that this is the radio emission from one of these objects, and this is the radio emission from the other. They're actually the, the, the uh, regions around the supermassive black hole in a, in a quasar, a distant quasar, which is way off in the background, somewhere in the middle here. And this little spot there is radio emission from the, the brightest cluster in a, in a large cluster of galaxies. The brightest galaxy in a large cluster of galaxies extends over the whole area. But the radio waves from the distant quasar are being bent around it by the curvature of space uh, caused by the mass of that cluster of galaxies. And so the light gets split into two images uh, that you see there. This, this is magnified differently, the top one. So you, get, you can see a jet coming out from the region around the supermassive black hole that's sort of magnified in the in the top image in a different way than you see than, than the bottom image. Um, we also map the radio sky with the telescope here um, and also the Parkes telescope in Australia and the, and the uh, Ethelsberg telescope in Germany. And um, we uh, produce this, this map of the, the invisible skies called the 408 megahertz map. 
uh, which is the frequency in which that, uh, that, that map is made. Uh, it shows the whole of the sky around you, so you sort of have to peel this off and wrap it around your head. If you can imagine doing that, I like to imagine that now and again. Uh, so you get this sort of thing all the way around your head so you can sort of look around the whole sky. So basically the point in the middle is the middle of our Milky Way. Um, where there's a black hole, Sagittarius A star, there's a bright radio spot there where there's a supermassive black hole. That was straight ahead, and the point at the top is straight over your head, the point at the bottom is straight below your head, the point at the left, you'd sort of point them straight ahead all the way around and to the back, and the point on the right is also that same point where you've gone around that way to the back, so it's the whole, the whole sky. And it's basically radio waves coming from stuff between the stars, so it's from uh, the plasma in, the, in interstellar space, so the charged particles spiraling around the magnetic field, producing that radio emission. And then dotted around on it, you've got things like uh, this is um, this is uh, Cassiopeia A, this is this is Cygnus A. Um, so this is actually an exploded star in our galaxy. This is another distant galaxy with a supermassive black hole at its heart. This is actually a lovely. This, this would be a lovely thing to see if it was visible, if it produces visible light in the same way as it does radio waves. Centaurus A, which is a radial galaxy with a supermassive black hole in the middle and two jets shooting out from it. But this is huge on the scale of the whole sky, many times bigger than the full moon, so it would be a lovely thing to see if we could see the radial sky with our, with our eyes. Um, so here's the little telescope now. It's grade one listed. Um, so probably the only grade one listed building that does scientific research and has wheels. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's... Uh, it's actually more capable than it ever has been um, because we've been able to upgrade it over the years. It's on its third reflecting surface um, you know, from the original 1957 one. It's obviously got upgraded receivers and everything else. Still the third largest telescope in the world. I like to show this picture to politicians um, because uh, I, I, they usually recognize this building. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I'd say, if you can imagine how big the Lovell Telescope is, if we built a Lovell Telescope or a copy of the Lovell Telescope in London next to the Houses of Parliament, it would be that big. <laughs> because it's actually within a metre or two, they're exactly the same height, the top edge is the spike on the top of the Big Ben Clock Tower, though. So it gives you some idea of scale. I did show that to George Osborne at one point, and he didn't bite on the idea of building a radio telescope there. <laughs> I've another word with it. Um, right, um, so we don't, so, that's, so it's, you know, it's, it's a significant instrument still. So. Um, we do have a network of telescopes, it grew out of all that work I mentioned on connecting telescopes with radio links. Um, so there's about, there's seven radio telescopes, two large ones here, the Mark 1 and the Mark 2, the Lovell and the Mark 2 now, five remote ones. <coughs> they were connected by radio links, they're now connected by optical fibres, so they are cables in the ground now. <coughs> Um, the amount of data that travels down that network uh, is, is something like uh, a fifth of the total UK internet traffic. So if you sort of look at the average data rate in a bit per second on the internet, then it's about, about a fifth of that amount the last time I checked, uh, is flowing down that network uh, here to Jodrell. It's, not the, it's a private network rather than the real internet that we use. Um, we go beyond that, we go out to telescopes across the world, so here's the European VLBI network indicated by the pink spots on, on, on here, uh, very inclusive, the European VLBI network includes uh, South Africa, it includes China, um, Korea and, and so on, moving out to Arecibo around the corner in, um, in Puerto Rico, so a really great example of European collaboration, um, which is very important for scientific research and we will carry on doing as best we can, given the unfortunate nature of the, uh, sorry for the politics, but uh, <laughs> uh, it, it is an important thing for us to do, to work together with all these partners, we'll continue to, we'll continue to do so uh, into the future. Um, so um, that, that is used to actually study lots of different things, for example, star formation in other galaxies, right through looking out into space and therefore back in time through the history of the universe. There's a galaxy called M82, you can zoom in on the heart of it, and map the radio waves coming from the middle of it, and we can look at stars exploding in that galaxy over time. So as they're born and then explode, we can study that process, and so we can see that right out into the most distant galaxies. So this is part portion of uh, the Hubble um, deep field um, in invisible light in the middle, and then sort of other side sort of insects where we're studying some of the most distant galaxies in radio waves. Uh, we can even use radio waves to look at the light from the Big Bang. 
Um, we we won't, don't do this with this telescope here uh, because we have to look through the atmosphere to, to use this and that, that gets in the way of these particular wavelengths and so we would need to use, um, it's best to use spacecraft, it's not impossible to use things on the ground but they have to be at high altitude. Um, so this is the Planck spacecraft that, we, that we, we were part of that collaboration in building some of the radio uh, amplifiers that are in that spacecraft and, and analysing the data. So this is a map of the light from about 14 billion years ago, uh, still visible, uh, flooding through the universe now, stretched out into the radio part of the spectrum. And it's that that tells us about the conditions of just after the Big Bang and so, you know, and, and therefore how the universe began. Um, the, the biggest future project that we have here at the moment is to something called the Square Kilometre Array. Uh, the SKA, uh, which will be built in um, South Africa and Australia. This is an artist's impression, obviously, I think. <coughs> Maybe not obviously. It will look like, will look like this eventually in South, in, uh, in South Africa. The South African element uh, is going to be uh, an array of dishes, initially uh, several hundred dishes, and eventually several thousand dishes. And they're going to be spread over about the same distance as E. Merlin is spread apart, so about 200 kilometres in the South African desert, linked together by optical fibres in the same way that emailing is, and, and we're actually uh, designing that, that network uh, for the SKA project, because of the, the experience we have in, in, in the emailing telescope. In Australia, they're going, to be like, they're going to work at a different part of the radio spectrum, so low frequency radio waves, and they'll use different sorts of antennas, they'll look a bit more like TV aerials rather than, rather than dishes. Um, so that's where they'll be in Southern Africa, in South Africa and in, in Western Australia, uh, but the headquarters is here. Um, so there's a building just beyond our control building here, uh, which is the international headquarters of that project, and we're just expanding that now um, to make that into the, uh, the, fine, the global headquarters that will probably be around for, for the next 50 years or so. So I think you know, in terms of the future of radio astronomy, uh, you can expect to hear about George Bank being involved in that for We've been involved for at least 70 years, probably another 70 years is, is, is on the horizon now. Um, I just wanted to finish with a few things about, about public engagement work, just because we're in the Discovery Centre now, which is the sort of public part of our site. And here's another nice old photograph of, of George Robank. Uh, this picture was taken in about 1970, um, and I can tell that because it's in the middle of the job that was done to upgrade the, the big Lovell telescope in 1970-71. So you can see this, the thing painted in red lead, um, the red thing in the middle here is the new, the new bit of steelwork that was added to the telescope. That wasn't there in the original telescope. And a new surface was built on top of the original surface and that sort of balanced out and that basically stopped it collapsing under its own weight and, and made the surface better so it made it more efficient. Um, but in the picture, you can also see the original visitor centre that was in the sort of location we're in now that was um, opened in 1966 and they had a planetarium built there in, 19, in 1970, 1971. Um, that was actually knocked down in 2003. It was in pretty poor condition. There was problems with asbestos and so on that made it, it was very expensive to refurbish. So it was demolished and then we opened a new discovery centre here. These, these black buildings that you come through one, you're in another and there's another one you're going to go to for coffee in a minute. That was opened in 2011. <coughs> Uh, we're back up, we're up to a, a, around about 150,000, just over 150,000 visitors a year now, uh, which is uh, more than it's ever had in the history of the visitor centre here. Um, that's about what it peaked at uh, before the shops started opening on Sundays. I gave people something else to do. <laughs> so, uh, so we've sort of done quite well in uh, getting back to that level. And there's more than 20,000, 23,000 school pupils visit every year now on educational an educational visit. And the future for the VISTA facilities here is going to be this um, building. We're just working on, on this at the moment. Um, it's a project called the First Light uh, Pavilion, which will be out in the Arboretum, in the gardens. We're, our build, we're in this black building that you can just see through the trees here. Um, but the, the, what we're going to build in here is a big uh, exhibition based on the history and the uh, of astronomy, mainly radio astronomy. Uh, and the Lovell Telescope, together with an, uh, a replacement of the planetarium, basically, which has been long missed by people. Uh, and that's funded by the, um, by the Heritage Lottery Fund, who, who offered us £12 million uh, 
Um, the project, uh, as it stands, is a £19 million project. So if anybody happens to have about five and a half million pounds, uh, we'll have a little collective hat. At the end. <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 I mean, sort of ser young, seriously, we do have to find that amount of money. So in the middle of a fundraising thing, if you do happen to know anybody who wants to donate several million pounds, just just mention that it's a great project to to be uh, to be involved in. And I'll finish with. Um, with just a quote, with just uh, Bernard Lovell talking not long before he died. This, he died in um, 2012 at the age of 98. Um, still used to come into work most days until he physically couldn't make it down the corridor. Stopped him when he was about 96 or so. Um, so um, he, uh, he was very interested in sort of public engagement with astronomy and the Society of Popular Astronomy is a great example of, of, of engaging a wide audience with Astronomy. So I'll just finish with, a, with a, him telling the story of how he got interested in science and it relates to effectively uh, public engagement, public uh, talks on astronomy uh, and, and if you think about it, it, it relates to the origins of General Bank itself. Well, that night I've never forgotten. Uh, it was a magnificent lecture room. Uh, the Bank absolutely fascinated by the by the electric sparks right across the lecture room by the demonstrations of what I don't remember read an article about like by the hissing carbon arc of the of the echoscope. And it was that one night that, that turned me into a scientist. So he was, he was basically fourteen years old and he went to a public lecture at the University of Bristol actually. Uh, and, and, it, and, it, and, it, and that, as he says, that one night turned into a scientist. He got interested in science. He became, did what he did in the war. He developed radar, came to Jodrell Bank, the old Jodrell Bank. And it's all down to the fact that he's schooled to come on a trip to a, to a book from outside Bristol, where he lived, to the University of Bristol, where someone gave a talk on, on the electric spark, as it was. So I think, it, you know, for anybody who's interested in involved, any of you who are involved in, in doing any talks or work with the public or schools, you don't know what you might be stimulating in the future. I think it's a good uh, thing to, for us all to remember. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so we do have a coffee break, but we probably we started slightly late, so we could probably have a time for a few questions if anybody wanted to, to ask one. Yeah. Well, I just, um, one thing I don't really quite understand, I guess, is about, you know when you're saying that you look at the radio waves that come from M82? Yeah. Well, what does that inform us about that galaxy? Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, that was a, a very quick potted summary of 70 years of radio sure. <laughs> I, I failed to explain everything fully, but yeah. Very um, so, uh, M82, <laughs> M82 is uh, uh, a starburst galaxy, so it has a lot of star formation going on, and it probably triggered by its interaction with another galaxy nearby. Um, and a lot of that action happens right deep in the middle of the galaxy. And, and if you're looking at that with a visible light telescope, the problem is that the, the dust clouds that are within the the space between the stars, the interstellar medium in that galaxy, block the view of visible wavelengths. And so you have to look at longer wavelengths, typically, to see through those dust clouds. So with the radio telescope, there's, there's two advantages, really. One is you can see through the dust clouds, you can see where the star formation and the star death, the supernova are going on in the middle. Uh, and the other advantage is that actually, because we can look at them with these global networks of radio telescopes, so from, from e Merlin through to the European VLBI network, for example, you can zoom right in and see the very fine detail. So we went from a situation with a single radio telescope of having a blurred view to a, to, to a network, which gives us a, the sharpest views in astronomy uh, are obtained in that way. So two, two advantages is seeing through the dust and seeing it in great detail right deep in the middle. Thank you. Uh, yes. I would assume, when we did the update in 1970, it was done for radio reasons, uh, with shortening the focal length. From what you just said, it was done for mechanical reasons, so you maintain the balance of the telescope. Right, so to, just to repeat it for everyone who didn't hear it, uh, the, the, the upgrade in 1970, the uh, gentleman had assumed we'd done it for, um, for radio astronomy reasons, to shorten the focal length of the telescope, uh, but then I mentioned mechanical reasons in terms of balancing the telescope. It was actually all those reasons. Um, so, so basically the, ori the original telescope <coughs> surface was sort of like this, it's quite, it's quite deep, 
um, so a longer focal length basically um, and the focus was at sort of level with the top edge of the, of the dish, you can imagine the tower in the middle with the focus there. What that meant was uh, actually the outer edges of the dish weren't very well used because if you sort of imagine radio waves coming in and bouncing off this edge, it's very hard for them to get into this focus when it's level with the top edge. So it wasn't a very efficient use of the full diameter, uh, so it was like it was actually a smaller telescope. Also the shape of the surface when they built it wasn't the best paraboloid, it could have been smoother. So, 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 the, so when it was built, another surface was built above it, was a flatter paraboloid, um, but uh, that meant the focus tower sticks out the top of it, and it can actually see the whole surface. So the whole thing became more efficient, more sensitive. It was a smoother surface, better paraboloid, so that made it more efficient. But actually, also, it was in danger of falling down, because they basically built this solid surface instead of the original mesh, it was all supported, but this weight was all supported on the two towers at the sides, but with the solid surface it was too heavy, and so there were cracks developing in the towers, and so they built this whole thing un un sort of underneath, <laughs> under underneath, this semicircular wheel going underneath, to help support the weight. The new surface on top, two things on either side of the axis, meant it was still balanced, so it solved all those problems. So you've actually named the uh, can, can Ian remember what the focal length change is? I can't actually have gone longer. Is it a bit longer? Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, what was the radio frequencies used in the early days? Um, what's the range that we use now? Um, so, in the early days we would have tended to use lower frequency radio waves. So you'd have been down to tens and hundreds of megahertz. Uh, we and uh, in a sense easier because you could you were stringing together wires and things that would work at those sort of lower frequencies. Um, the, you go to higher frequencies, you need to get a very smooth dish, which is harder to achieve. Um, so that sort of took time to get to those uh, that sort of mechanical precision. <coughs> um, so we've moved from lower frequencies to higher frequencies over time. Um, what stops us going to, we, so now our current, up, our current upper limit at Joggle is about uh, 22 gigahertz. Uh, we can't go up to much higher frequency than that because the atmosphere is a problem. Water vapor in the atmosphere becomes a problem. You need to get to higher altitude or into space to work at higher frequencies like that Planck spacecraft. Um, and uh, we, um, we went away from the lower frequencies as well because of radio interference is worse at the lower end of the radio spectrum. So we sort of started at the low end and sort of extended it up to the high end and then moved away from the low end and we're sort of limited there by the atmosphere and we don't tend to go much lower because of radio interference and being worse down at this end. So we're sort of between about uh, lowest frequencies, typically around about a gigahertz and highest frequencies about 22 gigahertz. Yep. Tim, this may sound a very simple question. When you have a, a normal radio at home, you tune in to what you want to listen to. Yeah. But you're um, essentially picking up everything. Does that mean that you have a spectrum analyzer that runs at the end of the signal? You know, when you receive the signal, you run it through a spectrum analyzer? Or you can't obviously listen to everything by tuning separate frequencies one after the other. So in terms of the mechanics of that, briefly, how would that work? Yeah, so, it's, so the question was about how, how we tune into different bits of the radio spectrum. So we do have radio receivers that are designed to work over a certain band in the radio spectrum. Um, and the, as time has gone by, what, we, what, what we're interested in doing is looking at much wider bandwidth of the radio spectrum. Um, so, so we do tune in. Um, with, it's called the heterodyne receiver system. You mix a radio signal at a certain frequency with the, with the signal you, you're using, and that, by adjusting the signal you mix in, you basically tune where you are within the spectrum. So that, that's always been true. The current way we do it is to have quite a wide bandwidth receiver, maybe um, uh, half a gigahertz wide. We're moving towards two, two gigahertz wide systems, so a really large chunk of the radio spectrum. Um, and then what we do is we, we, we digitally, um, uh, we produce a spectrum digitally, so we sample that the radial brightness, the power that we're receiving at a very high sample rate, and that effectively directly <coughs> measures the properties of the radio spectrum at those frequencies. So you're sampling at a very high frequency, and that's actually 
directly measuring the frequencies within the radio spectrum. And so we build up the spectrum using a sort of Fourier uh, transform sort of technique to produce a, to produce a spectrum. That's typically how you do it. But we often, you know, you have to sort of chuck, you, you often have to sort of, you, you would often mi mix a signal in and then break that, break that down into bands and then you might digitize those separately so that your computers can cope with the speed at which you have to sample things. But that's always evolving. So we're move, moving towards a two gigahertz wide uh, spectrum uh, with, with the new, with, with the new uh, coral enter here that we've got that combines the signals from all our, from all our telescopes. That's any help. Quick question. Oh, yeah. Well, Will your talk be available on any website anywhere? or? Uh, might be. Gentlemen with the cameras waving, so they'll be on the SPA website, yeah. yeah. In all this glory, glory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, you always have a trivial and fun question to end so that we can all go and have a brew because you know, I need the caffeine. Well, well done, sir. Uh, but uh, at home, I use um, um, fibre to cabinet and I've got 32. 30, 40 meg download and 10 meg upload. Now you're shifting an awful lot more data than that. Yes. Um, what sort of speeds? What's your external link speed? Uh, it's in gigabits per second. Yeah, not megabits per second. So it's thousands of times greater than yours. Yeah. So how much? Uh, it's something like eight gigabits per second from each telescope. I think. If I remember rightly, the current rate. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. Per per polarization. Um, so, so there's two polarizations. Yeah. Well, I'll show you later if you like. But, uh, okay, right. I think uh, that was a good point actually. It is time for coffee. Coffee's in the building over there. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, hang on. I'm being reminded of something. I Ian wants to remind me, and Robson here wants to remind me that we are very interested for the future of this society, uh, or in ensuring the future of this society. And so we'd like to. Uh, find out from people about what they value about this society, what they uh, what they might like to see that would improve this society going forward. And Ian's prepared to take. He, he'd like you to go and talk to him at points during the day to have a chat about that sort of thing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to come and try and grab people, but but really I want you to have a have a go and, and tell me because for the last few years we've been trying to improve it and in terms of a new PA now arrives on time. PA you've seen has been revamped, hopefully improved for you. The readers. Um, the web page is currently being revamped, refreshed, updated to make much more user friendly. Um, we're now looking to have a, a, an out of town meeting at least every two years, somewhere very distant from London for us in the north to actually go to and appreciate. But what other things can we do for you? It's your society. So I'm very keen to hear from you and I'll be also nobbling you. So grab me as the day goes on. Thank you very much. Enjoy coffee.